I'm Mindy Peterson, and this is Enhanced Life with Music, the layperson's guide to enjoying music's benefits. I do a lot of reading. I love reading. I've always loved reading. I'm at the library every week. Shout out to libraries and librarians everywhere. I also feel no obligation to finish a book that just isn't resonating with me. And there are some books that I skim, either the entire book or parts of it. I just recently read a book that was phenomenal. Every single chapter was so full of great information. It was written in a very engaging way. I am a note taker when I read books, and this was one of those books I felt like I was almost retyping the entire book because there was so much in there that I wanted to remember. As soon as I finished the book, I reached out to the author to see if I could get her on the show, and she agreed. I have with me today Dr. Vanessa Cornett, author of The Mindful Musician, Mental Skills for Peak Performance, published in 2019. Vanessa is the Director of Keyboard Studies at the University of St. Thomas here in the Twin Cities, St. Paul, Minnesota. An international clinician, she has performed or presented in 23 of the United States and in 14 countries across six continents. Her current research focuses on contemplative practices, performance anxiety management, sports psychology, peak performance, and the mental health of musicians. Welcome to the show, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Mindy. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. I want to start out our conversation by pointing out what you point out in your book, and that is that any human being, musician or non-musician, can benefit from the material here because it transcends the stage, it transcends the spotlight. Talk to us a little bit about how these practices are skills for life as much as they are skills for music. Sure, that's a great question, Mindy. I mean, I think most musicians, as they're going through the process of making music, find these connections between, you know, making music and expressing the self, which is sort of a connection to what we do in life anyway. But I think mindfulness is such a neat connection because when we talk about mindfulness, we're basically talking about awareness. And that, of course, is something that we do at in all facets of our life, not just when we're listening to music or making music. And I would actually say that awareness is sort of the root of everything we do in life, or at least the quality of everything we do in life, because we can always boil down what it is we're doing to how we're perceiving our environment and how we're choosing or not choosing to focus our awareness. So I think that was one thing that was so fun for me as I was writing the book. It was actually really hard to limit some of the discussions to music because the book is, of course, for musicians. But when you start talking about the psychology of awareness, you you end up talking about the psychology of being a human, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which is, I think, kind of what you meant. So, so yeah, I think that awareness is sort of the, the common, the common ground there. Yeah. Well, and we're talking, you're talking in the book a lot about musicians and performance anxiety and things like that. But you point out when you're talking about awareness, that it is through awareness that we experience the realities as we perceive them in life and that stress isn't what happens to us. It's it's more the result of how we interpret what happens to us. Right. And you point out in the book too about how mindful awareness is one of many forms of contemplative practice. And I when I read this I thought, oh yeah, that makes sense because you talk about mindfulness is often awareness in action. So journaling contemplative walking and running. Some of those are also ways that we have mindfulness in action or mindfulness in motion. Absolutely. And that's something that, to be honest, I wish I had sort of realized that decades ago, because I think there's this misconception that everyone has. And I certainly had it when I was a younger musician that mindfulness is the same as meditation. So I think we still have this misconception that you know, I get a visual image of someone sitting cross-legged on a cushion mm-hmm. with their eyes closed. And the problem, of course, with that image is that life happens with our eyes open as we're doing things. And certainly that's the case when we're making music. Mm-hmm. And it took me a while to make that connection that, you know, 
music is a contemplative practice because it's something that we do as we're um, deliberately sort of directing our awareness in the present moment. But you're right. There's so many other ways we can do things mindfully, whether it involves movement, walking, yoga, something that's sort of rooted in body awareness, but it can also be a, um, a sort of a creative activity, journaling you mentioned, mm-hmm. but also art and improvisation, things like that. Um, even forms of visualization, which aren't, you know, traditional meditation, are certainly forms of mindfulness. So mm-hmm. really, I guess you could do anything mindfully if you sort of put your um, put your mind to it. But I definitely think that if we broadened our understanding of what contemplative practices are, we could practice mindfulness as much as we wanted to throughout our day without limiting ourselves to, you know, 10 minutes or 30 minutes sitting yeah. quietly with our eyes closed. Yeah, I really like that, that distinction between meditation and mindfulness, and also the similarities between them, because meditation is one of those things I've read about, I know it's incredibly helpful for a lot of people. It's not necessarily something that's really resonated with me and worked for me. But this mindfulness really does. And it's it's been very helpful for me. So it, it's it's kind of neat to recognize the similarities there. And we're sort of talking about the same thing in a lot of ways. Absolutely. And I think, you know, I mean, as mindfulness sort of gains more traction in our current culture, which it is, um, I think we have to be really careful um, as we sort of interact in this world to realize not just what mindfulness is and what it can be, but also what it isn't. And I think a lot of people who are kind of drawn to meditation or to mindfulness and they they don't really pursue it may have a a misunderstanding based on just sort of how our culture packages mindfulness. A lot of people think it's, you know, it's calming the mind Mm -hmm. or it's stopping the thoughts or it's inducing a state of relaxation or and the truth is, if you're just paying attention to what is, it isn't necessarily any of those things. And I bring that up because a lot of uh, a lot of times students or musicians will come to me and say, well, you know, I, I, I really would like to, to engage in mindfulness, but I just can't quiet my mind. Mm-hmm. And my answer is always, well, that's good because that's not what mindfulness is anyway. <laughs> and if you find a way to quiet your mind, tell me because we'll make a million dollars together. <laughs> so I think that sort of we're so goal oriented. The idea that this is something I'm doing for this end um, is sort of a paradigm shift when we start to think this is something I'm doing mm. just because it is, you know. Uh-huh. Well, you talk in your book quite a bit about the distinction between directing our thinking and observing our thinking. And that's sort of what we're talking about right now. You talk about how the musician who has mastered both skills holds the most powerful ticket to performance success. And again, that's not just musicians, but um, learning that difference between directing and observing our thinking is so critical for any kind of performance in life, whether it's talking to that cute kid in your high school class or uh, (laughs) giving a presentation at school or on the job, a job interview and so forth. Talk to us a little bit more about that distinction between directing our thinking and observing our thinking. Yeah, I it's a it's a connection I really like to think about a lot because I think that musicians are far more familiar well humans are far more familiar with the idea of directing our thoughts that's not very foreign um, because we can decide you know even with the positive psychology movement we can sort of learn to identify our negative thoughts or our maladaptive thoughts behaviors or habits and sort of think about, no, let me think about what I want, or let me think about my positive outcome that I'm looking for. I also think that we engaging in things like imagery or visualization, you know, imagining something that's going to happen in the future, or even deliberately remembering something that's happened in the past. This is something we do so easily because we daydream so easily and we fantasize so easily. So directing our thoughts in a creative way is something that many people are very comfortable with. It's the other side of that, the true mindfulness side where you you make the decision 
not to direct the mind, but rather to watch what the mind is doing, that is the part that I think is really difficult because it's unscripted. Mm -hmm. You don't have an assignment. You don't have an end goal. When you're watching the mind, what is it you're watching? You know, that's really, really difficult. It's easy to say, but I think um, the thing that is so intriguing and that can be so frustrating is that we humans maybe don't have as much experience sitting back and just watching the thoughts with non-judgment. It's sort of like being thrown out into the deep end of a pool and not not knowing quite what to do. And that's the that's the part that takes so much practice to sort of think, well, what do I want to do right now? Do I want to direct my thoughts in this way? Or do I want to simply sit and watch what my mind is doing as I'm practicing or as I'm sitting here or as I'm listening to this piece of music. So I think we need to learn to develop both of those skills. In my experience, I think one of those skills is a little easier to develop than the other simply because we have more practice with it already. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot in the book about wellness and the relationship of mindfulness to wellness. I really like how you point out in the book how wellness generally refers to being healthy, especially as the result of deliberate effort. So it's not it, it's it's more of a proactive type of a uh, preventative health. You're preventing problems and illness rather than seeking out treatment once something has gone wrong. And right. you point out how a lot of our contentment in life as musicians and just humans involves our cultivation of mental wellness. Can you talk to us a little bit about the relationship of mental wellness to our overall state of being healthy? Yeah, I uh, mental wellness is something I would love to talk about for a few more hours just because <laughs> it's so important. And our culture is finally sort of recognizing the importance of mental health and mental wellness. It's harder to see because mental health is invisible. If I break my arm, I can go to a doctor and say, look, this bone is broken and they can fix it. And um, But when things go wrong, you know, what I call above the neck, um, when the mind starts behaving in a way that is maladaptive, that is really harder to sort of wrap our um, understanding around. And and we as a culture tend to be reactive, and that's true of our, our physical health as well. And maybe this isn't, um, this isn't fair to many um, mental and physical health specialists out there who are much more holistic in their approach. But as a general rule, we don't seek help until something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. So I don't generally go to the doctor unless I feel bad, and I don't generally seek out um, mental health help until something isn't going right. And I think the other way to look at that is what can I do today to make myself healthy, no matter what that happens to mean for me. So as a musician, well, as a human being, but certainly as a musician, if we're not very careful in how we're thinking, how we're managing the stress and anxiety that is very much a part of just being a human being, how we're um, behaving, how our emotions are affecting what we're doing, if we're not aware of that, then it's very difficult to be proactive with our own mental wellness because we notice that something's off until we feel bad. So I think that's sort of the root of, I don't know, being satisfied with what we're doing is to pay as much attention to our emotional and psychological health, as we tend to do um, for our physical health. Mm -hmm. Well, and stress is something that all of us experience. We talk about musicians experiencing performance anxiety, which is a form of stress. You talk in your book about how stress is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Our brains like some stress. And as humans, we tend to be the happiest when we're engaged in meaningful activity, kind of engrossed in a creative pursuit. And so it's most important not to avoid stress, but to learn how to manage it. And you talk about how mindfulness is one of the most consistently effective tools to manage stress. 
and develop compassionate resilience. You talked too a lot about the comparisons between athletes and musicians and how we have a lot to learn from one another. And musicians and sports psychologists are starting to collaborate a little bit more. Talk to us about some of the similarities between musicians and athletes and the performance stresses that they experience. Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, performers are performers, regardless of what it is they're performing. Sure. Maybe they're performing a figure skating routine, or maybe they're on a first date, or maybe they're performing a Beethoven sonata. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, when, when it comes to very highly skilled movements, which is what musicians and athletes both engage in, um, we're sort of in a, in a realm of optimal performance that uh, requires thousands of hours of practice to begin to master whatever that craft is. So, you know, musicians don't often think of themselves as athletes, but the truth is we perform at the same sort of elite level. We're just using different muscles and we're Mm -hmm. using our body differently. Mm -hmm. But the truth is we perform in front of an audience you know, even if that audience is just one other person, we often put ourselves in competitive environments or in environments that we perceive to be, um, to have an element of criticism there. We have to take care of our mental and physical health. I mean, there really is so much crossover in performance psychology for musicians and sport psychology for athletes that In the last, I would say, 20 years especially, musicians have really been looking at the sports psychology literature because the athletes and their coaches are are way ahead of us in terms of figuring out what mentally we need to do to have peak performance experiences. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they're not exactly the same, um, but what you said earlier about stress is certainly a common denominator there where we do need some healthy stress to keep us motivated, to help us build what musicians would call resilience and what athletes would probably call mental toughness um, to Mm -hmm. keep us engaged, to help us grow. So, so there really is a lot of crossover there, yeah. I think. Yeah, definitely. And another factor, too, is that skill alone is not really enough. You have to have those mental skills if you're going to be performing, because it's so easy to play the best performance of your life on a sonata at home in your living room when nobody is around, <laughs> or to run the fastest or to, you know, do some other athletic, like you were saying, the figure skating routine when nobody else is around. But if you don't have those mental skills that allow you to do that when you are in front of an audience and that skill alone is not quite enough. That's right. And I think, you know, all of us who become successful in whatever it is we're doing, we have developed the mental skills to keep us successful. But the thing is that some of us do that sort of by default, we find our way sort of subconsciously and we don't really know how we've done it. I think not many people have an sort of a proactive program for, gosh, I want to be here or I want to be able to perform with more confidence or I want to be able to do whatever. What do I need to do every day to make sure that I have sort of the mental skills um, that I need? I hear so often from music teachers, you know, we're guilty of saying things like, well, so-and-so, my student is just a born performer. She's just a natural this or Mm -hmm. or she just thrives when she's on stage. And, And we compare those students to other students who, you know, they do fine until you walk in the room and they absolutely choke at whatever it is they're trying to do. And I think that's unfair because what we're saying is, without my help, (laughs) these people have sort of found their way, but these other people who are otherwise wonderful musicians or very talented and motivated people, they haven't quite figured out how to navigate some of the... um, some of the challenging psychology of performing um, because we never learned that as children. That was never part of our sort of musical development as, as musicians or as teachers. Mm -hmm. So we're just sort of discovering what it is we, we need to start doing with, with younger students. Mm -hmm. One difference between athletes and musicians that you point out is that professional athletes 
tend to have a professional coach who motivates them and helps them set goals and keep goals and organizes their practice sessions for them every day. As musicians, we don't have that. So it's even more important for us to learn to be our own coaches. And this book is a really great way for musicians and other people to learn that on their own. It's it's really a great mix. The book is a philosophical kind of how are we thinking and also practice includes a lot of information on activities that develop specific mindfulness skills. So really a great mix of that. I ask all my guests to give listeners what I call an improv, which is a try this at home and experiment, a hack that will enhance listeners' lives with music. Do you have a recommendation today for listeners? I do. And actually, my improv recommendation is actually improv because I really believe that free collaborative musical improvisation is one of the funnest and easiest and most freeing ways to develop creativity and flow and stress management. Um, And usually when I say to people, musicians or non-musicians, hey, let's try to improvise, um, I usually get these huge eyes of fear because people are not comfortable improvising. But the kind of improvising that I recommend is non-tonal, non-metrical, if it helps, pick up a secondary instrument that you're not at all proficient with and just think of a parameter, whether it's a rhythmic motive, if it's two people improvising, uh, maybe trading off antecedent and consequent phrases, or what I like to do with my students is put two students at a keyboard and give them a non-musical inspiration. And that non-musical inspiration can be a color or a texture or a person they know Or a couple years ago, I gave some students um, the idea of improvising on Girl Scout cookie types. And so they did an improvisation on four Girl Scout cookies. And all that means is that they created sounds at the keyboard that sound like whatever it is they were doing. It's just an incredibly freeing and fun thing that we should all be doing more of, I think. Fun, fun idea. (laughs) That would be fun to do with someone too. Like you talked about doing it in a group in your class. I can see that being a lot of fun to do as a little duet with someone. Oh, it is so fun because you can have a conversation in sound, which encourages thinking in sound. And when you're both doing it, there's no judgment. There's just creative thinking and fun. At least that's how I see it. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, you gave me a lot of great links of how listeners can connect with you on Instagram, how they can find your book. Tell us what your website is, too. I'll include links all these in the show notes. Sure, that would be great. Um, Your listeners, I would really encourage them to contact me. I um, try as much as possible to respond to all the emails I get. The easiest way to contact me is my website, which is just my name.com, VanessaCornett.com. They can also follow me on Instagram at MindfulMusician.VanessaCornett. I do love to hear from people. I love to hear their success stories with performance, but I also like to hear if they're struggling, um, if they have questions. I learn a lot from other people because they will contact me and say, hey, here's something that I tried and it really worked. And that's so helpful. So I I do hope your listeners reach out. Mm, Wonderful. Hey, it's all my guests to close out our conversation with a musical ending, a coda, by sharing a song or a story about a moment that music enhanced your life. Tell us about the song you'll be sharing with us today. Yeah, the song I'm sharing is a, a piece for piano that my father actually wrote for me, and I found it recently, just a, a few weeks ago. I was cleaning out my music scores, and you know, my father was a composer. He mostly composed music theater works and didn't compose a lot of piano music, but he did compose when I was younger. Um, he did compose a few piano pieces for me, and this was back in the day where nobody used Finale or notation mm-hmm. software, so these scores are in his handwriting, and I love that because he he hid little little notes for me you know 
um, instead of the P-E-D for pedal, he put a little H-U-G for a hug. Aww. So I have little hugs and kisses sort of hidden in the manuscript. So the, um, the piece that I've shared with you is a, a piece that he wrote for me called Vandy's Theme back, oh gosh, maybe 35 years ago. Um, just a little, just a little prelude. What a beautiful song and beautiful connection between a father and daughter and one that endures through music even after the passing of Vanessa's dad. Thank you so much for sharing that touching song and story with us, Vanessa. I hope the information that Vanessa shared in our conversation and in her book is as inspiring and enlightening to you as it is to me. With all of the social distancing and quarantining and uncertainties going on right now, this is a great time to develop and strengthen these mental skills in relation to stress reduction. And hopefully it won't be long before we have more opportunities to use these mental skills in performances. Although keep in mind, Vanessa uses a broad definition in her book of performances, which certainly can include situations we're still having while quarantining, like like participating in a virtual meeting or having a difficult conversation, whether it's in person or on the phone. You can find the Mindful Musician book wherever books are sold, including Amazon. If you don't want to leave your home and prefer to not purchase on Amazon, you can purchase directly from the publisher. There's a link in the show notes as well as a 30% discount code that will help cover the cost of shipping and handling if you choose to order this way. Thank you, Vanessa, for that discount code for listeners. Speaking of books and quarantine time reading, there is still time to enter the drawing for a free copy of Indre Viscontis' book, How Music Can Make You Better. Indre is a scientist, psychologist, and working musician who was a guest on episode 35. 
This is also a phenomenal book. It's made up of short sections that each touch on a different fascinating way that music benefits our lives. Great quarantine time reading or a great gift for someone who could use a little lift at the moment. And it's a beautiful book that would look great on a nightstand. To enter the drawing for a free copy of Indre's book, post a screenshot of episode 35 to social media and mention something interesting from that episode. Tag me so I can see your post and enter you in the drawing. And if you're posting on Twitter, tag Indre at Indre This. Post on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn before the end of the day on Tuesday, April 7, 2020. The winner will be notified the following day, April 8. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hang in there during these interesting and challenging times. In Vanessa's book, she quotes John Kabat-Zinn, who said, We can't stop the waves, but we can learn to surf. Happy surfing, and until next week, may your life be enhanced with music.